Hi everyone, I'm Debbie Roberts, owner and financial advisor at Property Apprentice. Join me today for the Week in Review, where I'll talk about current events for the everyday investor and home buyer. Warning, I'm feeling quite feisty today, so if you don't want to hear my brutally honest personal opinions, you might want to skip this week's podcast. Our topics for this week, first up, landlords.co.nz on the 7th of November, investors snap up new builds at record levels. Second topic from the Wall Street Journal, epic housing booms meet their match in Australia, Canada and New Zealand. Third topic from New Zealand Herald on the 7th of November, $270 million budget hole. Aucklanders set for steep rates rises unless big savings are found. Fourth topic, New Zealand Herald on the 9th of November, the front page, who's to blame for Rotorua's emergency housing crisis? And fifth topic for this week in review from interest.co.nz on the 8th of November, spring finally arrives at the residential auctions with a late lift in activity. So first up this week, we've got landlords.co.nz on the 7th of November, investors snap up new builds at record levels. Mortgage property investors are making an appearance in the new build market with record high purchases since 2004. CoreLogic data shows 32% of new property sales went to mortgaged property investors in the third quarter of this year. This is significantly higher than the 25% average market share this group had in the last five years. CoreLogic research head Nick Goodall points to rising interest rates, the profitability of buying new builds and the ability to deduct mortgage interest payments against rental income as main contributors to the trend. However, if we look at the overall market, which includes new and existing properties, mortgaged investor activity is at an all-time low of 20% in September. Goodall suspects that investors may be looking to other investor options as short-term capital growth declines and as interest rates continue to increase. Despite stricter regulation and falling prices, he believes investors will not abandon the property market. Opportunities are still around and fewer competition means anyone with the ability to buy has power in their hands. My thoughts are, if you're an investor, you should only buy for one of three reasons. First up, cash flow. Secondly, equity, that's instant equity at the point of purchase or through value-add potential like renovations and development, for example. And thirdly, capital growth. You certainly can't find cash flow in new builds at the moment, even with the tax benefits, unless you've got massive amounts of cash that you're prepared to drop on one purchase. You also can't create equity to new builds. You know, you can't, I mean, the developers have already done that. You can't renovate something that's brand new and expect to increase the value. It's also difficult to buy a new build below its market value at the moment due to tight developer margins and increased cost of building. So that leaves capital growth. Uh, Hello, since values are dropping at the moment, that makes three strikes for an investor. That's not an investment, that's living in hope. So. Yeah, very few people that I think new builds make a good investment for at this stage in the property cycle. Might be great for a home buyer, for example, but uh, as an investment, not so much. The latest survey of real estate agents by Tony Alexander reveals that investors have decidedly stepped back from the residential market, although there is no mass exodus to be seen. They appear to be sitting on the sidelines. The survey shows that the biggest impact of the recent lift in mortgage rates on the overall market has been a 20-point deterioration in the number of agents seeing investors in the market. This is from negative 28% to negative 48%. While investors remain rare in the current market, their degree of absence is less severe compared to earlier this year when credit conditions were tighter and prices hadn't fallen as far as they have now. The survey also found a rise in the number of agents saying they're seeing more investors wanting to sell. The percentage is currently 6%. Last month it was negative 6, the month prior was negative 12%. Alexander said although this can't be called a wave of selling, it is likely that some investors are rethinking their property holding timeframes amid rising borrowing costs and their inability to deduct mortgage interest expenses. The report sees no improving trend in expectations for price gains at this point. Fewer agents are seeing investors hoping to get a bargain. My thoughts are, 
The cost of living crisis, along with rising interest rates and loss of tax deductibility, will be starting to have an effect on whether people can afford to hold on to any low yield and rental properties they've purchased. This is not good news for tenants either. Watch this space for further rent increases as landlords really start to feel the pinch. Test rates for mortgages have been increasing along with interest rates. So although there is plenty of interest from people who'd love to be in a position to buy a rental property, getting a mortgage is the most difficult thing about this current market. If you can get a mortgage, the opportunities are absolutely out there if you know what to look for. This is a fantastic time to be a buyer. It's literally called a buyer's market. If you wait on the sidelines for interest rates to drop or for the property market to start to recover, you're going to miss out on some massive opportunities that might not be back for another decade. If you're not sure about what's the right strategy or property for you, or whether the timing's right for you to invest, or where the best place is for you to invest, you can get impartial and unbiased financial advice from me if you choose to become a client of Property Apprentice. Even if you aren't in a position to purchase a property yet, I can create a financial plan for you that could help to get you there faster. We don't sell property, so we've got no vested interest in any property you purchase, which means that you can trust that we've got your best interests at heart. Find out more about how we can help you by attending one of our free training sessions, either online or in person. Refer to our website, propertyapprentice.co.nz to register, or book a time for a free chat to see how we can help you. Second topic for this week, the Wall Street Journal, Epic Housing Booms, Meet their match in Australia, Canada and New Zealand. Canada, Australia and New Zealand garnered the top spots with the largest property booms in recent history. Although much of the world has seen strong house prices, these three countries have dodged the collapse in prices in the US before the GFC and the booms have added more steam to prices during the pandemic. Since 1990, home prices in Australia, New Zealand and Canada are up 532%, 602% and 331% respectively, compared with 289% for the US, according to one measure from research firm Oxford Economics. However, all three countries are susceptible to the impact of monetary tightening. Compared to the US, where a majority of borrowers have long-term fixed-rate mortgages, those in Australia, Canada and New Zealand are on a floating rate, meaning that the mortgage payments go up as rates rise. A note from Oxford Economics reads that this is the most worrying housing market outlook since 2007 to 2008, with markets poised to face modest declines to steeper ones. The firm estimates that the fall in house prices in Canada could reach 30%, in New Zealand 20% and in Australia 20%. And I would assume they mean from the peak of the boom to the bottom of the slump. The full impact, not, you know, not from this point forward. The full impact of rising interest rates is expected to hit homeowners starting next year. Canadian mortgage broker Ron Butler said that 2023 looks ominous. Chris Joy, Chief Investment Officer at Coolabar Capital in Sydney, is seeing the biggest price fall since 1983. Using the central bank's house price forecasting model, if interest rates rose to 4.25%, house prices could fall by 40% in Australia. In New Zealand, around 45% of home loans will reach the end of their fixed rate period within the next 12 months. Many New Zealand economists are anticipating the OCR to peak above 5%. That could push one-year fixed mortgage rates to 7% or more. Although the article stated that would be un unaffordable for many homeowners and could force them to sell rather than refinance, my thoughts are that banks have been testing your affordability for mortgage at higher rates than 7% for quite some time, currently testing your affordability at interest rates at 8.5%. So it's likely to only cause real concern for you if you have a drop in income like losing your job. Although there's certainly no lack of available jobs out there if you aren't too fussy. If you're under financial stress, I highly recommend that you speak to a mortgage advisor sooner rather than later to investigate your options. Oxford Economics said that large-scale mortgage defaults are unlikely to happen this time, 
because people have saved up money during the pandemic, which will provide a buffer or paid down their mortgages in the meantime. In all three countries, unemployment is very low. Should prices fall 20% to 30%, it'll only wipe out a couple of years' worth of gains. Stress testing by New Zealand banks suggests that house prices will need to fall further before threatening financial stability, given that they've built up large capitalisation buffers since the GFC. As a matter of fact, stress testing by New Zealand Central Bank has made the sector well-placed to withstand a stagflation and low economic growth. The banks were even able to withstand a scenario on which house prices fell by 47% from the peak in November 2021, and if the unemployment rate jumped to 9.3%, both of which are highly unlikely to occur. Topic number three for this week in review from New Zealand Herald on the 7th of November, a negative $270 million budget hole, Auckland is set for steep rate rises unless big savings are found. Aucklanders are faced with the prospect of steep rate rises as the city struggles with its finances due to the cost of living crisis. Wage rises, high inflation and rising interest rates are causing the projected budget deficit of $90 million to $150 million to reach $270 million. Unless big savings are found by the Auckland Council and the wider council group, consumers could be seeing a 12% increase in rates. Adding to the deficit, is falling revenue from things like resource consents, which could be a sign that the economy could slow down next year. Mayor Wayne Brown declined to comment on the budget deficit, but said whatever numbers are made public will not include an expected blowout on the $4.4 billion city rail link. In his inauguration speech days ago, he mentioned that while Aucklanders may be heading into an economic and fiscal storm, he still plans to keep rates low, keep parks in good conditions and make the zoo and museum affordable for all. At the time of writing, the financial update was yet to be released, although Brown is setting out to tackle the $270 million deficit by increasing rates and savings and demanding better performance by the council, council-controlled organisations and the ports of Auckland. One option Brown could consider to reduce debt and the cost of debt servicing is selling the council's 18% shareholding in Auckland Airport valued at about $2 billion. Any suggestion of selling the airport shares is likely to face strong opposition around the council table, particularly from left-leaning councillors. Sources say Brown accepts inflation and falling council revenues as part of the problem, but also blames head office overheads and inefficiencies in delivering services. The governing body is struggling to find savings as Brown rules out cuts to what he considers the essential services Aucklanders value, although there is no definition on what that means. He'd also criticised former Mayor Phil Goff for using a $127 million payment from the government to cover cracks in this year's budget. The council received the money as part of a $500 million better off payment for handing over $11 billion of council water assets under the government's three waters reforms. At the time, Goff defended using the money to resolve a $175 million budget deficit, which helped rate payers with inflation and higher interest rates. Now, to be fair, I'm an Aucklander, and I have invested around New Zealand, and I can tell you that Auckland pays pretty cheap rates compared to the rest of the country. So it's a bit like looking at interest rates at the moment. You know, interest rates are higher than they were during the the lockdown periods. But in the grand scheme of things, interest rates aren't particularly high at the moment. Like Auckland rates aren't particularly high at the moment. It's just going to be difficult to pay higher rates when we've got the inflation rates increasing at at the rate they are. Okay, the cost of living crisis and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, if you want to learn more about investing in property, join me at one of our free beginner's guide to property investment events available live online or in person. Check out propertyapprentice.co.nz for upcoming dates and register today. If you'd like to find out more about how we can help you to reach your financial goals, you can also book a no obligation phone call or meeting with my husband, Paul via the website as well. That's propertyapprentice.co.nz. 
Fourth topic for this week, New Zealand Herald, 9th of November on the front page, who's to blame for Rotorua emergency housing crisis? Frustration starting to bubble in Rotorua because of the current state of emergency housing in the city. Fenton Street used to be a popular tourist destination, but as of late, it's garnered the name MSD Mile, with motels in the area filled with emergency housing residents. Rotorua Daily Post reporter Kelly Makiha shared on the front page podcast that community leaders, business owners and residents are concerned at the rising severity of the problem. Makiha notes that even if Rotorua only makes up 1.5% of New Zealand's population, it houses 10% of residents in emergency housing. One of the questions she has had in mind in the last three years is if Rotorua has that many homeless people or if they're coming from somewhere else. The Ministry of Social Development said it isn't deliberately doing this, but this has done little to appease the concerns of the community. It isn't just the surrounding community that wants to see better solutions emerge. Those living as residents within emergency housing also feel helpless, as many of them spend months waiting in motels for better accommodation. I mean, call me crazy, but it's almost as if we need more property investors in New Zealand, not less, to help house the people that aren't in a position to buy their own home yet, because the government certainly can't cope with the current situation. This would ease the pressure on emergency housing, which would also save the New Zealand taxpayers huge amounts of money each year. Private landlords and trusts already house approximately 87% of all tenants in New Zealand. We do it better than the government, and it costs the taxpayers of New Zealand nothing for us to do it either. I simply can't understand the thought process behind the war on landlords. The people that have been hurt the most are the tenants of New Zealand. Less rental properties means increased rents, simple economics, supply versus demand. If the government wants to bring rents down, they should be encouraging property investors, not penalising them for wanting to improve their financial position so they don't have to rely on the government to help fund their retirement. Lower rents would also help prospective first home buyers to save their first house deposit. Property investment is still the best way to grow wealth over the long term. With rents on the increase and the New Zealand housing market literally having clearance sale pricing at the moment, I can't think of a better time to get started as long as you're buying the right type of property for your financial position and long-term goals. Have I mentioned that at Property Apprentice, well, we could help you with that? Fifth topic this week, interest.co.nz on the 8th of November. Spring finally arrives at the residential auctions with a late lift in activity. The much-anticipated spring lift in residential property sales activity has arrived, although it's not as strong and is a month or two overdue. Interest.co.nz monitored 235 residential property auctions last week. This is much higher than the previous week with 187 auctions and 186 auctions the week before that. The orders of sale suggest that the higher level of activity is going to be sustained. Despite the increase in the number of properties being offered at auctions, the sales rates remain low. 72 of the 235 properties offered were sold under the hammer, which puts the overall sales rate at 31%. Auctions are a key indicator of real estate activity, and the latest figures suggest that there will be a seasonal increase in activity levels in the next few weeks, heading into summer. But in comparison to previous years, this year will remain much quieter. So in summary, more listings for sale, low numbers of actual sales, less competition from other buyers. Seriously, what the heck are you waiting for? Just remember that there's a lot of difference between buying a home and buying a good investment property. If you want to learn more about property investment, join me at one of our regular free training sessions available either online or in person. They're live training sessions and there's plenty of opportunities to ask me questions. I'll answer as many of them as possible. Register online at propertyapprentice.co.nz. And if you want to have a no obligation chat with my husband, Paul, to see how we can help you, you can also book a meeting or phone call with him via our website. That's propertyapprentice.co.nz.